Welcome to March for Our Mental Health. I'm Mary Hare Graham and I am the moderator tonight. I go to St. Luke's Church and I'm on the Cathedral Bookstore Board. And our guest tonight is the Reverend Cynthia Park. Um, and she is Senior Assistant, Senior Associate Rector at Grace Episcopal Church in Gainesville. And her, um, one of her biggest pleasures is working with Stuart Higginbotham, who's the rector at that church. Um, tonight's program is called Twice Upon a Time. And Dr. Park will give a presentation about how our past stories can be changed or morphed or looked at so that they can enhance our mental health today. And we've had a little bit of a discussion together and it, all of this is just fascinating. Um, our format tonight is kind of in a three-part system where um, we'll, Cynthia Park will give a presentation, three different presentations, and there'll be a chance for questions and answers between each session. And then um, we'll have a little time afterwards if there are any questions. Um, but we are ready to go. Are you ready to go? I am ready. Thank you so Great. much, Mary. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I encourage you to um, use the chat bar and uh, any thoughts or reflections that you have all along, just uh, go ahead and write them down so that you're, you're not trying to remember. And uh, as Mary said, I want to break this up into three chunks and then uh, maybe we'll take some time after each one just to clarify where we are. I'd like to begin with prayer to ground us. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for the gifts of memory and reason and imagination. Grant us the grace to allow these to work together for your glory and our welfare. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, um, those of you familiar with Brene Brown's work uh, know that one of her uh, best love lines uh, that she uses to try to interrupt uh, the drama train from leaving the station is the phrase, the story that I'm telling myself. Uh, the story I'm telling myself about what just happened. So uh, let's say that you're in the grocery store and everyone's masked and, but after a year, you've gotten really good at recognizing people by their eyes and their, their walk and what they wear. And you see someone you think you know, and you speak. And the person looks right at you and sort of harumphs, doesn't say anything, and pushes her card on down the aisle. So what's the story you're telling yourself? Ah, she never liked me. She's just pretending that she didn't know who I was. Well, I never liked her either. Or the story I'm telling myself is um, I, that, that wasn't her. I've, I've just embarrassed myself. I don't know who that was. Now I look like a fool. I'm a fool. The story I'm telling myself. So when we can go ahead and say that out loud, we can usually interrupt um, little drama trains from crashing into each other and get back on track. But what happens when that doesn't work? What happens when you find yourself going into a downward cycle during the day and you realize that other people wouldn't be experiencing this, that this is something peculiar to you, that there is some story playing out in your head 
And this is not the first time it has happened, that this is a pattern in your life. And again, going back to Dr. Brown's work, if you think about it, a lot of times these patterns end up being very shame-based. I, I knew I shouldn't have said that. I'm, I'm always speaking too loudly or speaking out of turn. Uh, I'm, I'm always taking all the air out of the room. All of these are messages that have a shame-based attachment. So what I want to do tonight is look at three practices that you can put in place immediately to try to outwit your own brain. Because here's, here's the good news and the bad news. Uh, the good news is our, our brains are wonderful computers. The bad news is they don't have a delete. They have an endless storage capacity and no ability to delete a message. So the first thing we're going to look at uh, are the stories that have made us crazy. Uh, and then we'll talk about the next two steps after that. A lot of my work is based around narrative psychology. Uh, if you want to know more about narrative psychology, I suggest uh, Arthur Frank, especially Frank's book, Letting Our Stories Breathe. In an interview for a magazine 100 years ago, Mark Twain said, when I was young, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. Now that I am old, I can only remember things that never happened. When I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. But now that I'm old, I can only remember things that never happened. If you think about that, we, we all have stories in our brains that don't get challenged. And the reason they don't get challenged or the veracity doesn't get challenged is because they've been there for so long. And there's a reason for that. Children are excellent at observing. Children can observe the mood in a room. They can observe every gesture, however subtle it is in a room. Children are horrible at interpreting what they observe. So children are 100% good at observing a situation and they're horrible about translating what they observe. We don't just think about stories, we think through stories. So I wanna give you an example. Um, when I was uh, very young, uh, before preschool, um, I'm in the middle of five children. Uh, I, think, I think I'm the observer and also the bad interpreter, but definitely the observer. And my father, uh, my father's form of bookkeeping was an envelope method. He had a, a desk that I now have and it had cubby holes in it and he had several small envelopes that he put cash in each envelope. And when he would come home uh, at the end of the day, the five of us were either told to be quiet or somehow we knew to be quiet. And we'd be very, very quiet while he would sit at his desk, go through these envelopes and make notes. When he put the envelopes away, he took his um, silver lighter, stainless steel lighter out of his pocket and clinked that lighter open and lit his Salem menthol cigarette. And at that moment, 
that was the all clear. And we could jump in his lap and he would play with us. Somehow I knew that our life was precarious. I knew that our security somehow was connected to that ritual every afternoon. I also knew that the, the danger, the threat ended immediately with the clink of that lighter. There's a whole lot about that story that just seems ordinary and you can dismiss. But I am telling you that I have grown up with two um, very fundamental stories in my life. One is a story of scarcity. And the other is a story that, that's even more troubling, which is that danger can be over like that. N neither of those is a good story. So we get stories two ways. One are these stories. That's an example of a story that we create the whole time we're growing up. And you can think of them in your own life. The other kind of stories that are in our brains are stories that are intentionally planted in our brains. So um, here are two examples. Uh, little boys have a story planted in their brains that goes something like this. Uh, there, there's a, uh, it's always a cautionary tale. So they'll say, well, there's a man in town who, um, when he was your age, played with himself, he self-soothed, and he grew hair on the back of his hands, and he went crazy, and he couldn't get a job, and now he just wanders around the town eating out of garbage cans. And that's a true story. Little girls are told a purity story. Little girls are told about a very sweet family who had a beautiful daughter who went too far. And her family lost all their friends, they became very poor, they were ruined, and that girl was never happy. I actually connected that cautionary story with that story of my father and the envelopes. And I thought, well, I don't know what going too far is. I mean, I get in trouble all day long, running too much, yelling too much, climbing too much. What if I go too far and whatever's going on with the envelopes doesn't work? What if I ruin us? So both these sorts of stories, the stories that we make up out of our own excellent observation, but poor interpretation and stories that are planted in our brains these stories operate inside us and they become the lens through which we process our whole lives. Everything that happens to us finds its place in a story. Um, in translating work, we use a concept called uh, the MIT, the most important thing. When you're looking at a, a text to be translated, you have to ask yourself a question. What's the most important thing about this text? Because until I decide what the most important thing is, I don't know how I'm going to translate it. Those translation choices are all connected to what the most important thing is. That's the way we think through stories. So we're constantly writing stories and we're also thinking through stories. At the end of each day, before you tell your partner about your day, whether consciously or unconsciously, you ask yourself that question, what's the MIT about this day? How am I gonna tell the story?
So we hitch a ride on these stories. They bring us up. Um, they work off of something called narrative interpolation. And all that means is that stories set up characters and actors who behave in predictable ways. So here's a story. The baby cries, the mother picks it up. This story is based on two things. The baby has an expectation, or the people hearing this story have an expectation that babies cry to signal that they need something. The other expectation operating is that a good mother picks up that baby. If the mother doesn't act in the way that the story is set up, she immediately is put on the defensive. She has to explain why she's not picking up that baby. So we have characters and actors in stories. Characters have motive and they can act. Actors can only act. They don't have any motives. So when we start to look at the stories that make us crazy and, and start working on them, we've got to identify the difference between characters and actors in the story. There's no sense engaging an actor. If you go back to the story of my father and the envelopes and the all clear with the cigarette lighter, the cigarettes and the lighter figure prominently in that story, but they, they don't have any incentive. They don't have any motive. They can't act on their own. My father invested them with some meaning. To him, they meant, now I can relax, or maybe they meant, now we're really in trouble. Uh, I, it, it could mean either one. But you see how that works? An, an actor relies on the character to make it do something. When I was stopping smoking, I had to realize that I had made cigarettes a character instead of an actor. Other situations were calling on that nicotine to do something. But I determined what it would do. The characters in that story are me, my siblings, uh, and my father. But the cash, the cash envelopes, the cigarette, the lighter, all actors. So let me just look at something here. So now that we've decided, okay, we know how to narrow down the stories that are tripping us up. We know how to tell the difference between characters and actors. The next step is to make sure that you haven't made a false connection. Um, Gareth Williams wrote uh, an anatomy, what is, the genesis of a chronic illness where he interviewed chronically ill patients. And what he found was that they would frequently say, well, when this happened, then this happened in terms of explaining their physical health. And sometimes that was the, the sequence. But many times what he discovered is that that wasn't the sequence. And by them thinking that that was the sequence, it was keeping them from accessing what they needed to do to actually start getting well. So think about that in terms of the way we do that with stories. Uh, Mary and I were talking about this before we started. Um, this is especially true with grown children of alcoholics or any other chronic situation of, of brokenness or woundedness. Um, so here's what we'll hear. When my dad left, my mom broke down 
and I immediately had to become the man of the house. This is the sort of story that a new bride hears when she finds herself trying to negotiate um, who's going to do what and, and how we're going to fight fair and, and all those sorts of things. And what she finally realizes is my husband or my wife didn't grow up like, like I did. They, they grew up too fast for some reason. And this is the reason that they'll give. Now, it may very well be true that uh, on some level, it may be true that when the father left, the mother did have a breakdown or the father may have left because the mother had a breakdown. To connect those two is not necessarily fair. That that is the situation that caused this child to imagine that now he or she had to move up maybe a story or a narrative that that child created in their own minds because they saw other people who should have been doing things not doing them and they determined in their own hearts this needs to happen a guy named uh, wayne mueller who does um, internal family systems work discovered 30 years ago uh, that he would have people like this, this um, apocryphal tale I just told. He would have these children of adults, alcoholics, um, who would come in for therapy. And they would, uh, they would come to therapy because they had managed to ruin an otherwise healthy marriage. So they'd be in therapy for a while. They'd work through everything. After three years, they would leave therapy Two years later, they would be back in therapy uh, and they would have found a new partner that they had managed to ruin that relationship with as well. And what he discovered is when children, again, who observe perfectly, but are bad at interpreting, when they act on that bad interpretation and learn survival skills as children, they don't understand that those skills are transferable as adults into healthy situations. They will unconsciously put themselves back into the same trauma that they grew up in because they think this is the only place my super skills work. So I don't know how to I don't know how to take these survival skills that I have and put them anywhere else. I can only be effective in situations that are um, abusive or chaotic. And so they keep going back into them. That's a story in their heads that this is the only place their skills work. But just think about that for a minute. Think about Think about the skills that a child growing up with alcoholic parents actually learn that can be transferred into healthy situations. And feel free if you are in this category to speak up, but I know for a fact you learn how to ignore drama and isn't that a helpful thing? Um, you learn that uh, chaos goes in cycles. You learn that the worst thing that can happen is to keep a family secret and that the best thing that can ever happen is to be the one to break that silence. Imagine how helpful just those four skills would be in any other setting in life. So at this point, I want to stop um, and get some feedback on these stories. These are called greedy stories. 
Greedy stories are stories that take up much more of your life blood than they deserve to. So let's get some chat going here. Or you can just raise your hand and unmute yourself. Yes, Sue Davy. Oh, wait, you're still muted. Andrea, can you unmute her? Sorry, I was just getting the um, the gallery. I I didn't have a. I didn't want oh, to go. Okay. Through. Okay. You didn't have a question. Okay. No. Yeah. Anybody? Um, I, I will try to speak. <laughs> I don't have a fully formulated thought, but I do identify as an adult child of an alcoholic and am currently working that 12 step um, and, and I'm seeing the narratives that I created in my mind in the chaos of the the dysfunctional family that I grew up in. Okay. Uh, this was a, uh, Wait, so, somebody's got a TV or something on. Might be Susan. Okay. All right, but Pauline, say more about that. So you're starting to see the narratives in your own mind that came yes. out of that? That gave me a very low sense of self-esteem for one thing. Um, okay. okay, stop um, right there. Stop right there. Tell me if you can identify how their choices affected the level of your self-esteem in what way? Their choice to um, maintain the dysfunction allowed me to get involved in it. And I, I chose to get involved in it to try to mediate the two parents who weren't getting along. And that came with me into my marriages and my fear of do, doing life any different from what I already knew caused me to recreate that drama in two marriages that were disasters. Um, so... <laughs> That's my narrative now, but I couldn't see that for a long time. I might have, if I hadn't gotten into a program, I might have gone and done it again in a third marriage. Um, and a lot of my behavior was based on fear of, of just uncertainty, you know, so. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a perfectly, uh, <clears throat> the need to feel safe and secure and loved is right there on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you were naturally seeking those things. What I see as the superhero skill is your courage and bravery without any uh, technical skills or knowledge to wade into that situation to try to um, mediate it. Because it was unsuccessful, because that's not the way recovery works, we can't, we can't uh, negotiate another person into wanting to be in recovery. Uh, the application of that super skill in that situation was not successful. But you still acquired at a very young age the ability to walk right into a hot mess with great courage. If you can just hold that one piece, because here's what we're gonna talk about now, is how we, this is where we begin to outwit a story. So Pauline, thank you for, for risking that. And if you don't mind, we, we may come back to you in, in just a minute. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else feel brave now that Pauline has dipped her toe in?
So the French philosopher, Michel de Montaigne says, nothing fixes a thing in the memory as much as the will to forget it. Nothing will fix a thing in our memory as much as the will to forget it. So remember I said the, the brain is a computer that has an infinite storage capacity and does not have a delete button anywhere. The stories that we have in our head are the stories that we have in our head. Um, however, remember I also said that we are constantly writing new stories. Once you have found this story, and so let's use Pauline's about um, recreating chaos or dysfunction in order to keep trying to fix it. Or in my story, uh, feeling like um, I had within me the capacity to quote, go too far and ruin everything, that that's how tenuous our security always was. And so to this day, I walk on eggshells. I, I'm terrified if I, if I speak my mind, I'll, I'll lose my job or, or lose my friends. If, if I say how I really feel about something, um, that that, what if that's going too far? It, even though I'm 60 years away from that story and, and I know that's not what the story was about. But when it got put in my head, it was wide open. Anything that you did that was too far could ruin everything. So here's what we're going to do. Stories have um, libraries, if you will. Uh, they also have genre. We're going to start writing stories that are companion stories or sequels to the stories that are already in our heads, we can even, and this gets really fun and closer to the truth, we can write prequels to the stories in our heads. In fact, I prefer to begin with writing prequels to the story to get some compassion around the story that I'm dealing with. So Pauline, let's go back to you. If you were just gonna give me a one sentence story that would be the prequel to the story of your parents and their disease, what, would, what might that be? I wish I knew right now. Uh, my no, no, you don't have to know. You don't <laughs> have to know, actually. I w you're a grown woman. You've lived life. You've watched other people. I want you to make up a reasonable story that would be a prequel to the people who ended up being your parents. Well, I seem to fall back to the dysfunction. It's hard to get out of that. But um, Okay. Well, what might be a prequel story around dysfunction? Well, my parents were first cousins. And I know that my mother had been jilted before they married. I know that my father was engaged six times before they married. So that creates a prequel. <laughs> For a I long love time. that prequel. Oh my gosh, I love that prequel. Pauline, you may be my new best friend. Okay, <laughs> that, that is a great prequel. That certainly uh, set up your parents uh, for a rocky beginning, uh, both of them wounded and uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but going for the most familiar by going for family, right? Right. At least you all know each other's junk. You got the same grandparents, right? Um, the prequel to my story with my father 
was that um, I, I knew that he had grown up uh, on a uh, sharecropper farm, uh, a sharecropper farm in uh, Texas, uh, about an hour between, or well, halfway between Dallas and Waco and just a little bitty hamlet. And it was very insecure. It was an insecure existence to begin with. Uh, and then when uh, the depression hit and uh, the Oklahoma Dust Bowl hit, uh, they lost even their uh, share crop uh, residency. And uh, the children were split up and given to neighbors and um, life was hard. Um, when the war broke out in Europe, uh, my father lied about his age in order to uh, go into the army because he heard that they had uh, clothes for the winter and clothes for the summer and food. And on that basis, he ended up uh, fighting in Europe during the worst of the war. <laughs> he had a story of scarcity. So we can uh, immediately, my compassion toward him uh, starts to be greater than my sense of scarcity that I inherited from him. Um, Another way of, so now we want to write companion stories. So these would be uh, sequels or uh, another chapter in the existing story. So Pauline's existing story is that she tends to repeat in relationships, in intimate relationships, the same sort of dysfunction that she grew up with. Uh, I tend to always expect that I will ruin every good thing in my life if I'm not careful and go too far. So the way to start writing a companion story is to block your troubling story on a stage. So I just have on this stage uh, our little living room at home with my father's desk and the hallway outside of his the living room where we would sit quietly until I heard the lighter clink. Uh, and I see his envelopes and I see him sitting there and I can smell those Salem cigarettes. Uh, for some reason, my mother is not in this picture, uh, although she was certainly present, but she's not part of the scarcity story. And she, she never is. Uh, interestingly, she had some, some boundaries there. She was not buying into the scarcity story, but that's what the stage looks like for me. Uh, Pauline, your stage might look like wherever your parents ended up having their knockdown drag outs and you walked in. So now I want you to have this scene in your minds and freeze it. Now remember, an actor can only act if a character makes it act. But an actor can talk, all right? So I want you to go to something other than your main characters. I want you to go to one of the actors in your story and ask them what's happening. We're not going to edit the existing story. We are now writing a different story. This is the way the story looks to the Zippo lighter, who's been in my father's pocket all day long while he fidgeted with it nervously. Or this is what the story looks like to that pack of Salem cigarettes. Um, or this is what the story looks like to my brothers. I don't have to actually know what it looks like to them. This is an exercise in pulling me out of my self-centered, 
self-absorption that has very limited information. Remember, the, the reason you want to be careful about trusting one story is that it has very limited information, especially if it's a story you've had since your childhood, because children are excellent at observing and very poor about interpreting. So, Pauline, was anyone, were there other children in your household? Um, I had a brother, but I, the memories I have of, of the, the alcoholic situation um, were after he left the house. And I mean, he was kicked out pretty much anyway. So there was another sort of traumatic. Thing. Oh, that's great. You remember him being kicked out? Yes. Okay. And that's yeah. that's someone's story that we need to to add next to your story. Mm -hmm. You need to imagine the way your brother would tell the story of that. For example, would your brother say it broke his heart to see his little sister left behind? in that dangerous situation and how he worried about you every day and thought about you, prayed for you, hoped you were okay. Imagine that story and the impact of that if that little girl had known that she had this guardian angel of an older brother out there missing her, praying for her, cheering for her. That's hard to imagine because the reality is totally different. <laughs> the reality as you see it. Yes, but yes. And but I, I, I wonder how it would sound from him. Well, I wouldn't recognize him if he were to say something like that. Um, it would be out of character for him as I know him now. Um, it would have been wonderful to have a brother like that, uh, but we were pretty much dissociated after he left for a long time. So There is nothing to prevent you from writing a story to go alongside the story of your trauma, True. about how wonderful it would have been had your brother not left and forgotten about you, but had he stayed and cheered you on or come and rescued you. I mean, any of you who have witnessed similar situations know that the kids left behind always fall asleep thinking they're going to come back and get me. I know they haven't forgotten me. So Steve Inski, the, one of the reporters for NPR, um, did research about 25 years ago on third generation uh, Holocaust children. So these would be children who uh, lived in a home with grandparents who had survived the Holocaust. Um, and in particular, he looked at situations where uh, the impact of lessons learned during the Holocaust had shaped the way the grandchildren were growing up and shaping their thinking. And in one uh, particular story, he interviewed a young man whose grandfather had survived the Holocaust, but who had never spoken about it. He never said anything about it. He never told them what camp he'd been in, what it was like, uh, how he got out, who in his family died. He never said anything about that experience. His children raised their child. All they knew was that they had this Holocaust survivor who was their father who lived with them. When the grandson was six or seven, he uh, got a bicycle 
and he was riding his bicycle and the grandfather would sit in the living room most afternoons just looking out the window. And the boy was riding his bicycle out there and some neighbor boys saw it, knew it was a new bicycle and they tricked him and said they wanted to see the bicycle and then they took the bicycle away from him. They left with it and um, the boy looked up in the window and could see his, his grandfather watching the whole thing. So the little boy ran into the house and uh, burst into tears and said, my friends took my bike. And the grandfather looked at him and said, friends? You wanna talk about friends? And that was all he said. He managed to teach that child two generations removed from the betrayal that he had gone through in that one half of a sentence. He just gave him what we call a legacy story. That's not a cautionary tale. That's not a story that comes from that little boy's own uh, excellent observation, but, but poor interpretation skills. That is a legacy story. And it is a legacy story of trauma. Uh, legacy stories can also be stories of privilege. Uh, and we are certainly starting now to uh, dismantle and unpack some of those legacy stories of privilege that we realize have been operating in our own minds and hearts for generations that we feel entitled to be treated in a certain ways. But I want us to talk now about these legacy stories that are based on trauma. I'm, according to the rest of that research project that Steve Inskeep did, um, this little boy's grandfather died and they still never knew anything about his experience. They may not have known the details, but I think he told them a great deal about his experience in that one line. So now this little boy has in his mind, you can't trust friends. You just can't trust friends. And he has that on good authority, right? Because who is the grandfather? How is the grandfather treated in that house? With great respect. He's being taken care of until the day he dies. He's contributing nothing. Um, he's not even talking. He's not really engaging. He is honored and revered and feared. And what he says carries weight. So for no good reason, he has now that, he's now taught that little boy that friends can't be trusted. How hard do you think it's going to be for that little boy to ever get past that? So um, here's another example of a legacy trauma story. I wanna get the date right here. Okay, so it was May the 6th, 1930. Um, the reason that it's important is that on that day, the worst tornado in American history to that point made a direct hit on the little farm town where my dad and his family were sharecroppers. When I went back to look at um, the archives about that day, uh, they said within 15 minutes, um, 
over half of the town was dead. Uh, virtually uh, anyone inside a building uh, was dead. Um, he was, I guess, four or five when that happened uh, and was in a field. And uh, my grandfather just put his body on top of my father down in a furrow. And that's how most of the town, the town that wasn't killed, that's how they survived was that they were out in the fields. When I looked at the archives and they gave the list of the dead, um, the first three names uh, were, were members of my family. And, and it was really chilling. You can appreciate the fact that that was like the Twin Towers if you lived in Manhattan. It, it was hard for them to ever talk about anything else except the day that the storm hit. And what most of them said was no one had anywhere to hide. And my dad did talk to me um, about the fact that he grew up hearing that if the sky got dark, you needed to find a place to hide. Can you imagine every time the sky got dark, the anxiety inside of you and, and the constant rehearsal of the story of every, how everyone died and how tragically they died and how it, they'll never be the same again. Which is why when I ask myself, surely you had to know there was more going on when you joined the army than that you were going to get winter clothes, summer clothes, and food. You had to know there was a war going on. You had to know you were in danger. But for him, Pauline, what had he learned? He'd grown up in constant danger. Constant danger. All it took was for the skies to turn dark. And you needed to be afraid. At least in the war, they gave him a gun. He had some sort of a plan for when danger hit. So he was the result. His prequel story was a legacy story of a community trauma passed on to him that affected his own sense of scarcity that I picked up on along with the cautionary tale about the girl who went too far. And somehow I had within me the power to, to be the storm itself, if you will, and, and destroy everything in life. I've really had to write a lot of companion stories. So in the last few minutes, I want to quickly get to this last part, which is the saving grace of all of this. Barbara Kingsolver, one of my favorite authors, says, memory is a complicated thing. It is a relative to truth, but it is not its twin. Memory is a complicated thing. It is a relative to truth, but it is not its twin. At the end of the day, we have got to cabin some of our stories and let them breathe and bring grace to them to say, this story needs more stories to surround it. And Pauline, I know you were cautious when I was pushing you to, to let someone else on that stage tell that story, but I'm gonna give you biblical permission for doing that. All the best stories have at least two totally different ways of telling them. How many creation stories do we have? Two. And they're side by side. And they aren't the same at all. 
They're two totally different stories, and that's how important it is to get some story out there about how everything started. It's important enough to talk about how everything started that the editors decided to just let both stories sit there side by side. There are two different stories about King David's son, Absalom, about his death. One says that he knew he was going to be killed by David's army. He knew he was going to die childless. And if you die childless, there's no one to keep your memory alive. If you have no memory alive, you can't be there when God comes back. So he built an obelisk in the wilderness that simply said, my name was Absalom. What a beautiful, tragic story. And then like five verses later, it says, and Absalom had three sons and two daughters. Both great stories. They both have the MIT. What's the MIT? The most important thing was that Absalom's life was about to end tragically. And the most important thing was that something about his memory and his spirit needed to survive. So um, we have two minutes left. Uh, I hope this didn't feel too much like a fire hose. Um, but that it gave you some practical ways of engaging the stories in your head. And I thank you for showing up on Tuesday in Holy Week to do this work. I mean, look at Jesus. We even have him coming in on an ass and a donkey and a cold. <laughs> right? Do we just let him sit side by side? Somehow he got into town. Um, okay, anything? Questions? Comments? That was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome, Sue. You're welcome. Um, well, it was a great joy for me to be with you. Um, you can tell that the way stories work in our brains is really important to me. Um, being a priest is all about uh, the sacred gift of being able to hear people's stories and to help them connect their stories to the story of God and God's love for us. It's beautiful. Anybody else have any comments or anything? This was extremely good, and we are so delighted that you were with us tonight. Um, I've got some stories to add companion stories to and to find um, some observers who would have some comments to make about different things. And, um, and not just from my past, from the childhood, but from some more recent times too. I think that's really gonna be helpful because I've got you know, different generations of stories to manage. So, um, I did want to note one thing that along with being the asso Senior Associate Rector at Gainesville, Cynthia Park is also a cognitive behavior psychologist. Psych is that the right word? Psychologist? Uh, yes, I'm a cognitive behaviorist. Yes. Behaviorist. And um, a fancy way of saying uh, people behave according to the stories in their heads. And if you want to behave differently, we need to change the stories in your head. I, I think the church calls that praying shapes believing. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, do you work with, um, do you, with other people aside from your job? No, my, my work at Grace is- uh, Full time. Is at, it, it's way past full time. <laughs> happily, it's happily, 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 way past full time. Yes. Um, so I, I've kept my uh, credentials uh, current. Uh, in, in case, in case I go too far and ruin everything. <laughs> so many people minute. need you. 
there's something familiar about that statement. I'm telling um, you. I think all women have grown up with that. And I think it does keep us in our place. Uh, on some level, we, we have been told you could ruin everything if you go too far. So big self-worth issue too. Yeah. Value. yeah. So. Um, another thing, Pauline, thank you so much for helping us learn some things tonight. Your um, bravery and courage and love for the community um, yeah. was really um, a wonderful gift for us because I could, the husband is also, a, um, his parents were alcoholics and boy, huh, I could pick out a lot of things. And so you've helped me gain some insights and um, yes, I want to thank you. That. Thank you, Pauline. That was well, that was thank you. I mean, I'm taking away a lot more <laughs> than you guys took from me. So thank you, uh, Cynthia and Mary Hare for saying that. Oh, you're welcome. And so does PK. Thank you, Pauline, for playing. Um, and speaking of playing, this is our last playground. March comes to an end. We've had a good March for Mental Health Month and ending on a wonderful note to help us go forward into our, our future days with tools to help us to better love ourselves and love um, our family and friends and the community and just become better people. So. Thank everybody for attending the um, programs and um, they've been wonderful and because of everybody's participation. And again, thank you, Cynthia, for um, being with us tonight. You have brought us many blessings. Thank you. Uh, Easter blessings on all of you. I uh, hope these are sacred days for each of you. Good night. Thank you all. Remember, Conversations with Priests, Thursday.